Uh, hi, like I said, uh, my name is Jeremiah Jordan. Um, I am a software engineer at Morningstar. Uh, you do uh, financial data. Um, I've been using Python for a year and a half and using Cassandra from Python for that same year and a half. Um, so today, uh, why are you here? Uh, hopefully you're here to learn about Cassandra um, and how to use it from Python. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what Apache Cassandra is a little bit. Um, then I'm going to talk about setting up a local and or development instance of Apache Cassandra. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how to use it from Python. Then I'm going to go into a little bit of schema design and data modeling in Cassandra. Uh, what am I not going to talk about? I'm not going to talk about setting up and maintaining a production instance of Apache Cassandra. That's a whole other talk. Um, so I'm going to talk, just talk about using it locally from Python. Um, if you want, you can get, this, get a copy of the slides at this address, um, or PyCon will have them. They'll be linked from the PyCon website later. Uh, anyone cares? All right. So uh, what is Apache Cassandra? So here's the description from the Cassandra wiki in their website. So Cassandra is a highly scalable, eventually consistent, uh, distributed, structured key value store. Um, it brings together the distributed systems technology from Dynamo and the data, data model from Google Bigtable. And so it's eventually consistent like Dynamo and it has a column family based uh, column with columns and a key value store like uh, Bigtable. All right, so the main things, it, it's column-based key value store, basically looks like a multi-level dictionary. Um, and you know, Dynamo from Amazon, Bigtable from Google. And then the other nice thing about it, it's schema optional. So if you want to tell Cassandra how your data is typed and how your data is stored in the tables, you can, and there's some extra stuff you can get out of that. But if you just want everything to be bytes and you can insert whatever you want, you can do that too. So here's the basic structure of how data is laid out in Cassandra. So you have a key space at the higher level, which is kind of like a schema from a normal database. Um, and then we have, inside the key space, you have column families. Um, and inside column families, you have rows which have keys and column names and values. So here's an example set up with some more real names for things. So maybe you have your application data, key space with a column family user info. It's got keys in it. The keys are sorted, are not sorted. They're in a random order. Um, for the most part, um, it's the recommended way of using Cassandra. Basically, the ordering of the keys is how Cassandra decides to store data across a cluster of machines. So it's a distributed system. Um, and the easiest way to do it is you have a random ordering of keys so that stuff gets evenly distributed across your cluster. Um, if you use one of the ordered methods of storing keys, then uh, you have to be careful to put, of putting data hotspots on your cluster um, because the, the data is put in order. Um, so if everything's grouped together, you're going to have one server that's getting hit by every single one of those requests for the data. All right, and then your column names. Column names are sorted, um, and column names are, can be typed. Um, so uh, like in the first column, the first column family here, the user info column family, the column names are strings. And so they're sor sorted in string sort order. In the second column family, the column names are time-based unique identifiers. And so those are sorted in time order. So, uh, you know, time one, time two, time three are going to be sorted in time order. And we'll get into how that's useful later. Um, and then you also have every column has a value associated with it as well. Um, and you can also tell Cassandra or not tell Cassandra the types for values. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, if you type values, then you can use some of the extra indexing features Cassandra has. And then you also have every column value, column name value pair also has a timestamp associated with it. And that timestamp is used to uh, do conflict resolution. So if multiple people write to uh, a given key with the same column name, the one with the higher timestamp wins. And the timestamp is client provided. 
So you need to make sure when you're using Cassandra, if you have multiple clients writing to the system, make sure their clocks are in sync if they have any chance of writing to the same spot. So like I said, it looks like a multi-level dictionary, right? Your highest level, you have your column family. Uh, you get in there, then you key into with your key, and then your columns uh, give you back their values. Um, really, it's the, at the lowest level, it's an ordered dictionary. So your, your columns, you can go through them in sorted order. All right, so now we know a little bit about it. Where do you get it? Um, you can get it from cassandra.apache.org. Um, or uh, if you want, there's a company out there called Datastax that provides Debian and Red Hat packaging um, for Cassandra. So once you've downloaded it, extracted, installed it, whatever, um, for a development instance, um, you're going to want to change the Cassandra configuration files some to away from the default locations. Um, and so you're gonna, in the YAML file, you're going to change where the data is stored, maybe where it's changed where the logs are stored. And then the other thing you're going to want to change on a development instance is probably you don't want it using all your RAM. Uh, by default, it's going to take up half the RAM on the system. Um, so you probably don't want that from a dev instance you're running unit tests on. All right, so then once you've set up your configuration files so that uh, everything's working, um, you run it, you just run the command line. Um, if you say dash F, it's going to run it in the foreground. By default, it's going to daemonize and run in the background if you don't say the dash F. Um, just some set, setup tips for running it locally. So usually what I'll do is make some templates of those configuration files and then have the startup script uh, run those templates uh, through something to stick the current path in there so that I can just check it all into Git for my development instance. And then when someone pulls it down the first time they start it, it generates configuration files to run Cassandra in place in whatever folder that the person checked out the code to. Um, just nice for running unit tests. So then, uh, so now that you've got it up and running, so the first thing you need to do is connect and set up um, some key spaces and column families for your code to stick stuff into. Um, there's a command line interface tool that ships with the distribution. So you start up the command line tool, connect to it, and create your key space. Um, when you create a key space, you also have something called a placement strategy, which basically says how Cassandra is going to store that data across the cluster. So where it's going to put each key, the default strategy is it's going to take your ring of machines and chop them up into equal space chunks and stick the data across those uh, different locations. Um, there's other different things you can do. There's network aware strategies that can know about data centers and will make sure data goes into, you know, one copy goes into data center one and two into data center two, however you want to set it up. Um, and that's where the strategy options come in there. Uh, where for the simple strategy, basically you just tell it how many machines you want a piece of data on. For the more complex strategies, you can tell it one piece of data over here, two over there, three in the third place, however you want to set it up. So then after you create your key space, you want to create your uh, column families inside that key space. Like I said, when you create a column family, you have to tell Cassandra what kind of uh, columns you're going to stick in there. Um, there's a if you just want generic columns, that you can, there's a bytes type um, that you can just stick whatever you want as a column name. Or you can tell it columns are strings, and then they'll be sorted in string order. You can tell them they're UTF-8 strings. It'll take care of that. Or you can do things like make it a time-based UUID so that you can sort things in time-based order. Um, you can make, stuff, make them integers, floats, whatever you want. Basically, a column name is really just another spot you can stick data, unlike most databases. Um, so then once you've got your schema set up, you want to connect to the system. Um, so you're going to go, you, know, you want a client. Um, you can, there's the Cassandra wiki has a links to most of the up-to-date clients for connecting to it um, in a variety of programming languages. The ways to connect to it from Python. So Cassandra is built uh, with Thrift as its main interface. Thrift is another Apache project that basically gives you uh, remote procedure call interfaces in a variety of languages. There's a Thrift compiler. You give it some IDL. It spits out uh, code to talk to a server that implements a Thrift interface. Um, and Thrift has generate code generators for probably 20 different languages at least. Um, so you don't really want to use the Thrift directly. 
not a good idea. Um, so you want to get a native client. So for a native client, um, there, PyCasa is the one I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's also Telephus. If you're doing, if you have a twisted app, uh, you'll want to use Telephus. Um, and then there's a new client called uh, Cassandra DB API 2, which basically implements the Python DB API 2.0 on top of. Uh, there's a new CQL query language that's being developed as a new interface for talking to Cassandra, and that DB API compliant interface uses the, the CQL, CQL uh, interface. Um, the CQL interface doesn't support, have all of the functionality of the Thrift interface yet, um, but it's, it's getting there. Um, but that exists as well, if you have something that's already using a DB API 2.0 interface. So this is why you don't want to use Thrift. Basically, the, the IDL generated code has a whole bunch of extra objects and stuff like that in it, so you get a lot of code generated. Um, you want to use PyCasa, just doing the same thing, connecting and inserting a value. See, it's you know half a third of the lines of code. So PyCasa um, has very good documentation up on GitHub, and then there's also an example application implemented called Twisandra, which is basically a Twitter clone um, using Django and PyCasa. Um, it's a good, good to go look at. So go through a little bit of using PyCasa. Um, so connecting is very simple. You create a connection pool object. You tell it what key space you're going to connect to. And you give it a, server, a list of servers that are in your cluster. Um, and PyCasa will, you know, if there's any errors or anything like that, it'll do retries across the different servers in the connection pool. And if you have multiple threads or something like that using the same connection pool object, it'll multiplex those threads across the different servers in the connection pool to spread out the load. Um, Cassandra is actually very good about uh, scaling up pretty linearly. Um, when you add more nodes, if you add more processes to, to go across those different nodes, um, Netflix actually published a, a pretty good benchmark, um, very extensive benchmark, where they had millions of clients talking to hundreds of Cassandra nodes across multiple AWS regions, and there was a very linear scale up um, in their benchmark. Was, I was surprised when I saw it. <laughs> it was pretty impressive. Um, if you would go check out Netflix's tech blog, they have a lot of articles about them using Cassandra. They're using it from Java, but uh, it's a good, at least uh, what you can do with Cassandra is pretty interesting. So now once you've created your connection pool, you're going to create a column family object. Um, you're going to tell it what connection pool to use and what column family you want it to talk to. So then once you have that column family object, um, you want to write data, but just say insert, tell it what key you want to insert for, and then give it a dictionary of column names to value pairs, and those will get inserted. Um, read, also very simple. Uh, you say get, give it a key, um, and you can optionally pass in a list of columns, and there's actually some other options to get that I'll get into later for uh, fancy things you can do. Um, delete the same thing, give it a key, optionally a list of columns. All right, and then so the batch interface, um, which is probably what most people are going to want to use a lot, um, you do a batch insert, and basically you just give it a multi-level dictionary of a key to another dictionary of columns and values, and it'll insert all of that in a batch. And then there's also a streaming interface for batching. So if you create a batch, a batch object from the column family, you can optionally give it a queue size. If you specify a queue size, basically every whatever you so in this case 10 function calls, it'll batch those together and send them off to the server. Um, or you can also not specify one and it only send when you call send. But then once, once you've created this batch object, you just do your inserts and your deletes uh, just in your removes, uh, just like on the regular object. And then either when the queue size is hit or you call send, it's going to send all those off. And you can, actually, you can batch up inserts and removes in the same batch and it uh, works fine. So this is good. You know, you've got a stream of data coming in. It's always more efficient to do, thing in do things in batches, but you can treat it just like you're doing one at a time. Your code doesn't have to know that it, you know, internally batch stuff up. And the other thing you can do with batches is do batches across multiple column families. And this is nice because basically your, your, your insert is going to succeed or fail atomically 
as an operation, you know, across m multiple column families. So it's nice um, for doing things like inserting into a main column family and also into a second column family, maybe as an index or a denormalized query for some other kind of, some other way of doing it. Um, to do the batch across multiple column families, you create a mutator object, and then for every operation, you specify the, a column family object uh, for the column family you want that batch operation to happen on. Um, and it basically works the same way as the single column family batch, but we'll do the insert across multiple column families. And then uh, if you want to do a batch read, um, you use multi-get, and you basically specify a list of keys, and you can also optionally specify a list of columns um, to go across for multi-get. Um, the other thing you can do, so like I said, uh, columns have types. So, and they're stored in a sorted order. So you can do uh, what's called column slicing. And so when you say get, you can specify start and finish uh, values for doing a slice, and it'll return you all of the columns which have a column name that's, you know, sorts between those two values. Um, and which, so, you know, which you can do for uh, addresses, but which is also nice for if you do things uh, like, if you do the time UUIDs, you can say create uh, a start time, say uh, 10 minutes ago, and then ask for all of the things that have been inserted in the last 10 minutes, you know, all of the activity in the last 10 minutes for something. So if you're doing like your, your Twitter clone, right, your timeline, your Twitter timeline could just be a row in Cassandra, and you're going to say, you know, give me the last 10 minutes worth of data to show to somebody. Or if you're doing a, storing log files or anything like that, you know, other things you can do um, for storing, s sorting and storing data. Um, and I'll get into a little more of that with, when I talk about indexes, because that's one of the uh, main ways you can do indexes. So uh, you can also type, uh, if you tell us, if you tell PyCasa the types of your data, or if when you create your schemas and you actually store into Cassandra the types for things, then PyCasa will do data conversions for you. So you don't have to insert, to give everything to PyCasa as strings or bytes. Um, you can actually just stick an integer into that dictionary and PyCasa will go, oh, he told me that age is an integer, so I'm gonna you know, convert 32 into a byte stream and insert those bytes into Cassandra or he told me height is a float, so I'm going to take that float and convert it to an IEEE float representation and store that in Cassandra. And then it'll do the same thing when you do the get back out. You know, it knows that that thing is a float, so it's going to convert it to a float object, so you're, actually, you're going to get a float back when you uh, get your answer. And then once you've started doing types, um, there's a nice... Uh, basically uh, object model uh, classes you can use, um, we call it the column family map. Um, doesn't give you a full ORM object relation model, just gives you an object model. So you, you can't insert multiple things. On the prior slide, if you have a type fault, what happens? Um, you'll get an exception. So it, PyCasa will give you an exception, or uh, if you've told Cassandra what type is something to be, Cassandra will give you the exception. Um, so you set up these, basically you create these objects, you use these special types from the PyCasa type library to say, you know, the key is going to be a UTF-8 string in this case, the email address is ASCII, age is integer, height is a float, joined is a date type, um, and then uh, you create a column family map object, um, just like a, a column family object, but you're also going to pass in that uh, object you created in the that says what all the the column names map to in terms of their types, and then uh, to write something with this interface, you instantiate the user object, then just fill in all the attributes on it. The key is John. The email is John at Gmail. You know, age 32, height 6.1. They joined on date time dot now, and then when you call insert, uh, Picasso is going to take all those things convert all the attribute names into column names, convert all the objects into the byte representation for their type, and insert it into Cassandra. And then when you read, just read back with a get of the key, and it's going to give you, it's going to create one of those objects for you again, so that you have all those things, all those, an object with all those attributes with the right types. 
um, read back out of the database. You can also do a multi-get to get multiple objects back out. Or you can do a remove on an object that'll delete that object from the database using the key that you specified. And uh, the only thing that's special here is you need to have an attribute called key, um, which is going to be the key that it's going to use for the, the key value storage. All right, and so then uh, the next thing you do, so uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, all of column value pairs have timestamps associated with them. Um, you can uh, get at those timestamps by saying include timestamp equals true on get, um, and then on inserting, you can uh, insert your own timestamp instead of Picasa just using now. Um, if you want to specify what the timestamp is that something gets stored with, um, and you do that on the insert, just add an extra parameter to insert to do that. And then there's also something called consistency level in Cassandra. So when you have a multi-machine uh, cluster, um, the consistency level is how many machines do you want Cassandra to check the data on before it returns you an answer. So if you say you're storing data across three machines, um, when you insert, you can say, I want you to return success to me when one of those machines has said, um, I got the value. Or you can say, when I want a quorum, which means n over two of those machines have gotten the value, uh, return success to me. Um, and basically, you can pick how consistent you want the data to be and how fast you want your insert and read operations to be using this consistency level. And so if you want stuff to be, always be consistent, you can always use insert with quorum, read with quorum, and then you're always going to get the same answer when you read and write. But you can also do things, if you want it to be fast, and you don't care that maybe you get an old value by a couple milliseconds, or if that server just came up for being down, so it missed the write and hasn't gotten it propagated to it yet, you, know, you just care that it's fast, you can use one, and then you'll, you'll just get whatever value that that machine has on it. Um, so you can pick how consistent you want your data to be and how fault tolerant you want your data to be. All right, so indexing. So Cassandra has some native indexing built into it, and you can also uh, roll your own indexing. Um, not, I'm going to go into it a little bit. Um, if you go check, get the slides later, here's some links to some good articles about doing indexing in Cassandra, going more in depth with it. Um, the native indexes are uh, very easy to use. You just update your schema to say that you want Cassandra to index a column. Um, you have to have given, told Cassandra what type that column is going to be. And then basically it's going to build a column family in the background that's keyed by column values um, so that when you, you can search on that index and it'll give you back the rows that go with it. Um, you can also do filtering um, when you query. Uh, you always have to have at least one equality operation, but after it's matched that equality, you can do things like greater than, less than, and equal to on other columns in your query. And I'll show that real quick. And then, um, but this isn't recommended for really high cardinality values. So Cassandra has a maximum of two billion columns in a row. So I mean, really high cardinality. Um, but it, so if you have some column that's going to have a, a value in it that you're going to have you know, a billion values, it's not going to be very performant using the, the native indices. And then the native indices also slow down writes a little bit because the server always has to do a read before write um, before it can insert your data so to make sure it doesn't have to update an older value. So to use it, to add an index, you're just going to go to your, in the command line, do an update column family, then we're going to say update it so that state uh, is a UTF-8 and it has an index on it. Um, the uh, only index type right now is keys. Um, they, I don't know what other indices they're planning to add, but that's your only choice right now. Um, and so basically, once you've added that index um, in PyCasa, you're going to create an index expression. So here I'm going to search for everything, everyone who lives in Illinois and their age is greater than 20. And then once I've created those two index expressions, I create an index clause out of those two expressions. And you put the clause in the order you want them checked. Um, and then you can use the get index slice passing in that clause. And it's going to return you an iterator that's going to page through the values returned from the database um, to give you back all those the index values. Um, and it actually will default paging, batching data back from the server. I think the default page size is 1,000 items. You can specify how, what you want the paging size to be. You can also specify a maximum count of things to be returned. 
The other thing you can do, uh, you can roll your own indices. Um, basically, you know, like I said before, use the batching interfaces to write data to two different column families so that um, you don't have to do the read before write if you know the thing's new. Um, the other thing you can do if you do it yourself, denormalize your queries so that when you read something from the index row that has your data in it, you don't have to uh, read the index and then go read the column family, the, the main column family. And then, uh, so I think I'm told we're, we're done. Uh, so does, any questions? <laughs> Which one? The very first one? Oh, yeah, oh, the URL for the slides, yes. I can go back to that. Other question? Can a key be a composite value? Yes. So, uh, yeah, so can the key be a composite value? Um, Yes, uh, so Cassandra does have, uh, I didn't talk about, there's a, there's a more advanced pe feature that's new to Cassandra 1.0 where uh, you can tell Cassandra that a key or a column name is a composite value. Basically it's letting uh, the composite types, let you say this key is going to be a string and an integer or this column is going to have two strings and an integer and a date in it. And it's basically just so that uh, it's going to concatenate all that stuff together before it stores it to the database. Um, and then uh, for the, and the indexing, if you actually have composite values with the indexing, uh, the indexing can know about the composite values. And so you can do some interesting sorting things with using the composite values so that it'll, it'll sort by the, the first part of the composite and then the second part and the third part. Um, so yeah. So what is the data that you store? Can you, can you please walk up to the microphone? Yeah. Yeah, hi there. What is the data that you store at Morningstar in Cassandra? Um, so we're, we're using it as an operational data store. So we're storing uh, chunks of data that we then go back in later to Yeah, so Cassandra, so he's asking how does Cassandra store the data with the key value system? Does it store it to RAM first, to disk first, whatever? So Cassandra, depending on what consistency level you tell Cassandra when you write data, when you write data, if you say a consistency level of any, it's just going to write the data in RAM before it replies back to you, but it, will, but it will then eventually propagate it back out to other machines. If you use a consistency level of one, it means the data is in the commit log on disk of one of the nodes. So basically, uh, Cassandra has, has a commit log where basically it's going to write data real fast to the end of a commit log in order, and then event, as it collects data up, it writes stuff out to uh, SS tables on disk. Um, you know, which are uh, the sorted tables uh, for actually indexing stuff. Um, the, so writes are really fast because as long as you keep your commit log on a separate disk from your random access to your tables, um, the commit log is always written in sequ sequential order. So your hard disk is always just, your read head doesn't have to, your write head doesn't have to move. It's always just writing to the end of this file. Um, so that makes the writes fast. And then, yeah, so then with your other consistency level, it's how many machines is it in the commit log of? Um, before it replies back to you. Anyone other questions? Uh, and uh, also, if anyone has other questions about Cassandra, feel free to come talk to me. Uh, the Data Stacks guys are also are, are actually a Python, PyCon sponsor as well. Um, they have a booth um, if you want to ask them about Cassandra. Um, maybe you've, maybe you've asked answered this. Is there a way to specify a replication level before you return? What? Yes. That's what, that's what I say. That's the consistency level. So the consistency level you specify is uh, how, well, I'm sorry, the replication, you specify replication on a per column family basis. So you say this column family gets this many replicas on these servers. 
but then, uh, your consi and then your consistency level specifies how many of those replicas data is written to or read from before you get an answer to your query. Yeah. Yeah. So is this the sample for this kind of applications or can it be used for some? I mean, it, it can be used for pretty much anything. I mean, <laughs> anything that fits this data model, you know, where you're coming in with keys and, you know, you want, you know, either ranges of values or other things. I mean, and because of the ordering of the columns, there's interesting things you can do with, you know, having data based on keys. Um, but, I mean, if you're, and, the other thing with Cassandra and most other NoSQL key value stores, um, basically you want to store your data so pretty much every query that you come up with for what data you want has its own representation inside the database so that you can get it out based on key. And so I think that's our last question yeah, we have time for. That's all the time we have and I want to thank Jeremiah for this great talk. Thanks for coming. <laughs>